the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christian Outreach Fellowship. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Father, for we know, Lord, you say in your word that we're never alone, Lord, that you would never leave us, no, never forsake us, God. We thank you, Lord, even as we thank you for your presence this morning, God, for we're two or more gathered in your name. There you are in the midst. So, Lord, we welcome you here this morning, God, and we ask now that you would just be lifted up and glorified today, Lord, as we have our worship service this morning, God, in your honor, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would bless those who are on their way. They would arrive ready to hear from you today, Lord, and just to worship you. We pray, Lord, you would clear our hearts and our minds of the cares of this world, Lord, that this time may be set aside just for you, God. Just be lifted up and glorified now, Lord, as we worship you through song. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Please. 
Hallelujah. Yes, God is the strength of our heart. We thank you, Lord, for your strength. For your strength is made perfect in our weakness, God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for your strength is our help, God. We thank you, Father, for being that help for us, God.
us, all of our strength and all of our help comes from you, God. Our help comes from the Lord. Lord, we thank you, Father, for that help that you give us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us, God. We thank you, Lord, just for this time and the opportunity that we have, Lord, to just sit at your feet and worship you this morning, God. We thank you, Father. We praise your name, Father. We lift you up, Lord. And we ask now, Lord, as your as we continue with the rest of our service, Lord, we ask that you would bless the pastor as he brings forth your word today, Lord. We ask that you would just give him a double portion of your blessing, God, for his faithfulness to you, Father, and just uh, ministering the word to us, God. And we ask, Father, that you open our ears and our hearts and our minds and our eyes, Lord, that we may see, hear, experience, feel, understand you today, Lord, as your word comes forth, Lord. Just Speak to our hearts, God. We love you and we thank you, Lord, just for this time and the opportunity, Lord, this Sunday morning. It's in Jesus' name that we thank you. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Christian Irish Fellowship Church. Please open your bulletins and follow along. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure, steadfast. Hebrews 6 19. The word for today What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 31. Wednesday night Bible study will be held July 17th at the Sheffield Community Center. We encourage you to read ahead 1 Corinthians and allow the Lord to speak to you as you prepare your heart for next week's message. The resource table is filled with many Christian books, magazines, pamphlets, tracts, music, movies, and other resources to help you to understand God's Word and to grow in the grace and knowledge of who He is. All resources are available for free or to sign out for your usage. Please stop by after service today. Audio recordings of CUF services are available upon request. To request copies of any Sunday service, please sign up at the resource table. Also, all messages will be posted to YouTube. Here at Christian Outreach Fellowship, there are many opportunities to serve. If you would like to serve in any ministry here and can be faithfully committed your gifts and talents are welcome and needed. To request more information regarding any ministry, please see Pastor Jones at the service or sign up at the resource table. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. 1 Peter 4.10 For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Romans 9.15 And with that we can stand and greet one another in the Lord.
This morning we have the opportunity to give. Giving is an opportunity to bless the kingdom of God. God uses human beings. You know, it's interesting. Yes, God can make money. He can make gold rain from the sky. But he uses human beings in order to build up his kingdom, in order to share his word. And um, he uses us in order that he may bless us as his people. So once again, we've been given this awesome opportunity to give. God loves a cheerful giver, an hilarious giver, someone who loves to give. Remember, he's a giving God, a giving Father. God so loved the world that he gave. He expects us to give as well. And he will give more seed, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians. He will give more seed to the sower when we give. If we sow sparingly, we shall reap sparingly. But if we sow bountifully, I mean, if we, if we sow bountifully, we shall reap bountifully. God says that in his word. So, he has a sowing and reaping principle. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give, Lord. All those who have given today, I pray that you would bless them. God, give them more seed to sow into your kingdom. We pray that you be honored and lifted up and all is said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a song this morning by Fred Hammond. And uh, it comes from Psalm 51 where David said, Lord, give me a clean heart. Renew within me a right spirit. And, um, you know, I, I just pray that as you listen to the words today, you will realize that, that God is a merciful God. And that if we come to him, if we, First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In fact, John tells us earlier in First John chapter 1, if we say we have no sin in verse 7 and 8, then the truth is not in us. So we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know this from Romans chapter, uh, chapter 3. So... As you listen to the words, allow the Father to give you a clean heart. And we all stand and worship together. Amen.
Father, this morning as we stand and sit before you, Lord, we humbly come before you realizing that my words at this particular time are, should decrease and your words should increase. So I pray now, Father, that as I speak, my words will be pleasing to you. I pray, Father, as we listen today, that as the Spirit speaks, those who have an ear to hear, let them hear what your Spirit says, Lord. And I pray that you give us an ear to hear and hearts to understand. As Nehemiah and Ezra explain things more plainly and clearly to the people, I pray today, God, that your Spirit would do that. And that I would do what I can, God, to be pleasing in the words that I say. We pray, Lord, that um, you bless Brother Vince. I think he's back in town today. Or anyone else who may be on their way or not here. We pray for the spot that we're at. That these people here would come and know you. We'd be a, a witness of light. We love you, Daddy. Now as we travel through your word, be honored, be lifted up, be glorified. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 We got a lot that we want to cover today. Um, one of the things I want to point out is the importance of just studying to show yourself approved under God. A workman or workwoman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's important for us to study God's word, spend time in it. So that's why we have all these scriptures written down on our sheets that we hand out every Sunday morning. You know, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter, or the Lord said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23, 29, he said, my word is like fire. In fact, he went on to say, my word is not only like fire, my word is like a hammer. So God's word is like hammer, it's like fire, it's able to break open and break up the fallow ground. God says also, he tells us over in, in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, that God's word is, is quick and powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. So it's like a hammer, it's like, a, it's like fire, it's like a sword. I mean, God's word is powerful. In fact, it says in Hebrews 4.12 that God's word is quick or literally alive. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 63, he says, my words, they are spirit and they are life. So when you hear the word of God, it is different than reading any other book. When you hear the word of God, it is, it is different from listening to anything else because it has the ability to work in our lives. And this is why, you know, Jesus said, as he quoted from Deuteronomy 8, 3, when he was being tempted in the wilderness, remember he says, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And it's funny, he quoted from Deuteronomy 8, 3, and right before that, God says that he humbled the, the people of God. He allowed them not to have, just like Jesus said, had 40 days and 40 nights. He allowed them not to have, he put them in situations so that they would realize, and I hope that all of us look at the situations that we're going through in our lives and we would stop and realize that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So this is why it's so important to spend time in God's word. If you ate once a week, you would be sick. You can't expect once a week to come here and get full, and you might get full, but you're going to make that last the whole week. Anyway, our question of the day, our question of the day, turn over quickly to, to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 20. We'll use this as an example. God told the children of Israel, and he told Moses, he said in Deuteronomy chapter 20, look what it says in verse, verse 16. But of the cities of the people, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive. But you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, the Jebites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. And look at why he says to do it. Lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations which they have done for their gods, or done to their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. Look what God told Moses in Numbers chapter 31. You all can turn there. In Numbers 31, God told Moses, he said, I want you to kill off all 
all the, the Midianites. And he said the reason being is because the Midianites, the Midianites had been disobedient to God. Not only that, look what he says here. And the Lord says to Moses, everyone turn to, Deut to Numbers chapter 31. He said, take vengeance on the, on, on the Midianites for the children of Israel. After you, and he says, I want you to do this, and then afterwards you're to be gathered to your people. This was the last thing that he was to do. And so, look at what God also says. Look at another example of this. Look over in, um, in I guess we can just look in 1 first, first Samuel. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. God told Saul, he said, I want you to kill off all the Amalekites. Look what it says in chapter 15, verse 1. You all can turn there. I'll be there ahead of you. 1 Samuel 15. God says, Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord has sent me to anoint you king. He says, o over all the people of Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the Lord your God. Thus saith the Lord your God, the Lord of hosts, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them, both kill both man, woman, infant, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Kill everybody and everything. In Genesis chapter 7, God brought a, a flood upon the earth and he wiped out, he killed at least at that particular time. It may have been over a billion people on the face of the earth. He wiped them all out. Now, our question of the day is, do you have a problem with that? Do you have a problem with God taking people's lives? Is that a problem? You know, one, let me point this out first of all. One of the things that has happened, and this is our question of the day, one of the things that has happened within our society is that we have created a God that fits our desires, that fits our needs, that fits what we want. And what's happened is, is that we created God in our image and in our likeness. And we're told in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 that God created man in his image and his, in his likeness. But what's happened is, you know, every, especially unbeliever, has created this particular God based on the way they feel, the way they think, what they've experienced and not based upon the word of God. So first of all, let's turn to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. And look at what we're told. The Lord appears before Moses. And, he, and Moses desired to see God, and God says, okay, I'll show you, my, show you who I am. He said, I'm gonna hide you in the cleft of the rock, and what's going to happen is tomorrow I want you to get these, these, uh, these two tablets and bring them back up because he destroyed the first set. And so he comes up on the mountain and there he is and God passes before Moses and he proclaims his name. Look what it says in verse 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the, the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the, the third and fourth generation. So the first thing God says about himself is that he's a merciful God. But then in the end he says that I also won't clear the guilty and I will bring judgment upon generation and generation. See, one of the things you have to understand is God is a God of love. We're told in 1 John 4 that God is love. We're told in John 3, 16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God is a loving God. Ezekiel 33, verse 11, God says he gets no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So God loves the unbeliever, gets no pleasure in their death. But we've got to understand that God, believe it or not, he is a killer. Now he's not a murderer. It's unfortunate that the, the King James translates in Exodus chapter 20, the word, the word, um, uh, murder, it translates it kill, it says thou shalt not kill, it, it should be thou shalt not murder, God doesn't murder, but God does kill. And at times God is like a hitman. 
In fact, turn there to Matthew 10, 28. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, Fear not him who can destroy body, and after that do nothing else. But fear him who can take your body and soul and cast it into hell. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we've been doing this on Wednesday nights. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, it says how that they had an old saying in Corinth where they were living in sexual sin. And they said, well, you know, we all got to eat. And we all, and you know, sex is just like any other drive, like eating and sleeping. And they, they had an old saying that said, meat for the belly, belly for the meat. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with it. And Paul said, you know, if you think like that, believe it or not, in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, God says he'll destroy them both. <laughs> okay? He'll destroy you. Remember in 1 first, in first Corinthians chapter 5. There's a guy caught in sexual sin. Even in that situation, you know, remember what Paul said, turn this one over to the devil. But what he said was, if he doesn't repent, and what he said in that, in that chapter, he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, hand such a one over. And so what's interesting about it is that even in that situation, God is in control of somebody living or dying and being handed over to Satan. So we have to understand that God does intervene in our lives. In fact, we know in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, God says, don't complain, Miss Francis. And I hope none of us have been complaining lately because he said, think about those examples in the Old Testament. He said, when, when people complain, that he unleashed, Lisa, the destroyer upon them. He's got this guy who works for him. In fact, the NIV puts it, the destroying angel. So this guy, just he goes around and destroys people's lives. He took their lives for complaining. I just want to show, look in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Let's just, we're on it. Let's just keep going with it. Exodus chapter 4. Look at what God told Moses in verse 11. So the Lord said to Moses, because Moses was complaining. He's like, you know, hey, come on, God, I can't, you know, I can't speak. I can't do this. I don't want to be the one that you sent. And look what God told him, because Moses didn't want to go. And didn't want to represent God in this situation. And it says in verse 11, So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who has made the mute and the deaf? Or who makes the one mute and the one deaf? And the one seeing or the one blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go. Look in 1 Samuel. I mean, you know, we forget these verses. You know, I remember showing this to a, um, a, a um, word of faith person. And they were like, really? I never saw that. Well, listen, I hope you all see this today, that God, you know, God does deal with people's lives. Look what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Look at what we're told in verse 6. Look what it says when Hannah speaks. She says, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings back up again. She even knew that. One last passage on this. Look at Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Look at what God tells us in verse, in verse um, 6 and 7. He says that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting, there, there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, there is none other. I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create darkness. Some of your translations put it evil because it seems evil in your sight, but in some people's sight. But he says, I create calamity. Are y'all with me on this? I, the Lord, do these things. In the Old Testament, God in, Exodus, in, in Genesis chapter 38, remember God struck down Onan. And remember God did it because he, he said he was wicked. And he killed him because he was wicked. Remember, we know that, that God, uh, in, in Leviticus 10, he strikes down Ahab and Abihu, who decided they're going to offer up strange, but they're going to get drunk and work in the house of God. So God says, okay, I got something for you, and God strikes him down. Remember, even in the new, remember, we talked about, about this not too long ago, Uzzah. When the, the ark is being brought, he decides to put his hand forward and hold the ark up. God struck him dead. Remember in the New Testament in Acts chapter, is it Acts chapter 12? Yes, it's Acts chapter 12, verse 23. God strikes Herod dead. 
He sends an angel to kill him. So let's understand this. God does take life. Turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And look at what we're told. And we'll start in verse 15. Romans 9, 15. Let me point this out. God does what he wants to do, Josh. It doesn't matter what you think, how you feel. I don't need to make excuses for God, mass, or none of us do. Because sometimes you're running to people on the street or people say they don't believe because God killed the babies and what you're going to see in the side and did this and that. We ain't make no excuse for God. He is God. And that's just the way it is, as the song used to say. And if you don't like it, just get over it. I ain't heard that saying before. You don't like it? Get over it. Look at what we're told here in Romans chapter 9. <laughs> Look what it says in verse 15. God says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whoever I have compassion. <clears throat> it's up to God. It's not up to you and me. In verse 18, therefore he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he hardens, he will harden. One of the things that we have to understand is that all of us should be dead now. All of us. God just chose to have mercy. Remember what we're told in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The sin that the, the soul that sins shall surely die. Romans 3, verse 12 says that we have all gone out, that we're all sinners and gone out of the way. We're told in Romans 3, 23 that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We should be dead, all of us. And the nerve of us to question why God does something. Especially when we go against the laws of nature that God has set up and we do stupid things. But whatever be the case, we can't question God in this respect. I heard a story one time about a science, a group of scientists who, who got together and they said, you know what, we're just, we want to have a conversation with you, God. So God said, okay, let's, what is it? What's going on? And they said, well, listen, we're done with you, God. We don't need you anymore. And God said, really? They said, yeah, you know, we don't. We don't need you anymore, God. You know, we are able now to make the atomic bomb. We're able to make hydrogen bombs. We're now able now to make nuclear weapons. We're able to mass destruction. We're able now to clone people. We're even able to make other people, you know. We don't need you anymore, God. And God said, okay. Let's have this little context. And they said, okay, okay, what you going to do? And God said, okay, let's, let's, let's make man. And they said, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. We can clone. We can do it. And God says, well, let's do it the old-fashioned way. They're like, okay, all right, no problem. So they go out in the field. And the scientists say, okay, God says, start making man with the dirt. And all of a sudden, the scientists reach over and they grab a piece of dirt. And God says, no, no, no. Get your own dirt. And how would me on this? Get your own dirt. You see, God's able to cause, he, he's, he can make ex nihilio, meaning he can make something out of nothing. We are just squirrels. You ever see squirrels running around trying to get nuts? That's what it amounts to. So he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And if he's chosen you and he said mercy on you, praise God. Look in Ezekiel chapter 18. In Ezekiel chapter 18, God says something important in verse 4. He says in Ezekiel 18 verse 4, all souls are mine. All souls are mine. We all belong to God. Period. He can do what he wants with us. And no, you cannot sell your soul to the devil. I've heard people say, well, he sold his soul to the devil. That's not true. All souls belong to God. Period. And here we are on this earth, sucking up his oxygen, walking on his terra firma, 
and he can do whatever he wants. Now we know from Romans 8, 28, he's going to work all things together for our good because we love him, amen? But his desire is not only for our good, but for his glory. Let all things be done for the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 31. Y'all feeling me on this? And we know that once we, Galatians 2, 20, it says, Paul says, for I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live, I live according to the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. When we get our focus on him, we're willing to give our lives back to him for his glory. In fact, God tells us to kill at times, right? Right? He says in Romans chapter 13 that he's ordained those people, the, the law, the police department, the, the judges, to enact certain laws. In fact, we're told over in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 3, there's a time to kill. Yeah, yeah it is. Romans 1.32, God says something interesting. He says how the people, remember in Romans 1, he says people have, have you know, been turned over to a reputate mind to do these evil things and the rest of that. And remember God says that he's given some over to homosexuality, bestiality, lesbianism, all the rest of this stuff. And all, he names a whole list of other things there too, by the way. And so he mentions all this. And then he says in the end of Romans 1.32 that such people are deserving of death. You ever look at that closely? He says they deserve it because see in the Old Testament, when we live like this, you know, you would be put, uh, when you committed us, you would be put to death. You would die. Now we live under democracy, we don't live under theocracy, but let me say this, we are deserving of death. So if God has mercy on any of us, it's an it's a, it's a all-out miracle. But he's a loving God. And I do believe in mercy and killing. That's another thing. If you can follow along in the sheep. I do believe in mercy and killing. And I do believe that the Lord of times will love a person to death. He'll love them to death. And what I mean by that is if you really think about it, the Lord is, is the Alpha and the Omega. What does that mean? Does anybody know? What does it mean he's the Alpha and Omega? He's the first and the last. He's able to see the beginning of time all the way to the end, right? He's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's all these things. He's able to see everything at one time. And the Lord knows the future and the decisions that people will make. That's why he said in Matthew 26, 24, Jesus said about Judas, Josh, remember what he said? It would have been better that he what? Had never, Matthew 26, 24, been born. Because of stupid decisions that he did. And the wicked and ungodly decisions that he did. And God knows for some people. That I believe that for some people. It would have been better had not been born. He knows diseases that will come upon this earth. This is why I firmly believe, for one of the reasons that he wiped out the, the, the um, had the Jewish vision wiped out the Midianites, was in the Amalekites was because God enacted vengeance on them. People think they'd be getting away with stuff they'd be doing. You know that? They go and spread a bunch of bullets in the hood. You think you're going to get away with that? Uh-uh. Just like the Midianites, just like the Amalekites, who hadn't pushed God's people when it came up out of Egypt. God says, now go get them and wipe every one of them out. No, you're not going to get away with that. No, you're not. And lots of times God does his stuff in vengeance. But he is God. And when it comes to babies, why did God have the babies killed? Why? Let me just say, that first of all, there's none good. None of us deserve to live. All of us deserve to die. Babies and all. Oh, they seem so innocent. And God does speak about innocent blood in Scripture. But let me say this. I do believe in God's mercy and his love for people. I do think at times he will have the children wiped out in order that they come home and be with him. Because if they live long enough on this earth, they would grow up and they would grow up and learn to reject God by being around these, this, this, these wicked and ungodly people who have rejected Christ. And so sometimes when babies go home to be with the Lord and those who are underage, to be of accountability, to be with the Lord. Sometimes it maybe needs to be some rejoicing because God took them home to be with them, to with him, instead of being in this wicked earth 
and being in this place where people will continually reject the king. And he knows that they will do that, but in his mercy, he'll take them home before they become poison and get to the point where they're unable to believe. John 12, 38 and 39 says some people get to the point where they're unable to believe because they keep rejecting the word of God. And y'all feeling me on this? Next thing today that we're going to deal with, and we may get to our lesson of the day, but this is our application of the day. Warnings. And we're going to talk about the Titanic today a little bit, or a whole lot, so hang with me. How many of you have ever been warned about something, but you ignored that warning, and you went on and did your own thing? Raise your hand. I remember some years ago when I was in high school. I got a job, and I was making a little bit of money. And I remember my boss told me, he said, save your money. Don't go buy one of these piece of junk or cars. So what I decided to do, Josh, is I had to have a car because I was dating, and, you know, I had to have somewhere to take that chick, you know, wherever we needed to go, you know what I mean? This is BL before Lisa. She would have given me wisdom not to buy that car, but... I go and I, I take off work and I, I tell the people on the job that the reason I'm taking off is because my sister was in a bad accident and I need to be there at the hospital for her, you know. I lied. Made my way to this, I just got paid that, 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 uh, that Friday and made my way to the Salvation Army. Salvation Army had these junkers that were parked out in the, in the, in the the parking lot and they were selling them. And there was a Nissan, Miss Francis, for two hundred dollars. I said, Wow. I'll take it. I've been warned to stay away from those junkers. I wind the windows down. Back then it was just the wine. It didn't have the electric. And it was feeling so good. I was driving, Josh. I was going down Rhode Island Avenue. It was awesome. I finally arrived at 17 with a decent vehicle. Uh, as I'm driving, all of a sudden, something said, boof. Smoke's all over the place. I open up the hood and I start looking inside and I realize something. The car had no water in it or antifreeze and the engine was blown. I own that car and drove that car for 35 minutes. Tow truck took it up the street, I had to pay him, parked it. I sat in that car, I never drove the car, never drove it. Finally, somebody came along and, and stole it and sold it to the drug yard. But I was warned. Some of us can be, you know, I've noticed as human beings, some of us, as I've shared in here before, we can be, God can tell us don't do something and that's all he's got to do. Some of you are children like that. He just says don't do it and we won't do it. I think Joseph was like that. I think Daniel was like that. But then some of us are the type that, that as I said before, we learn from other people's failures. We see how they messed up and we say we ain't doing that. I think some of the children of Israel were like that. Like, I see how they screwed up. I ain't going that way, you know what I mean? But then some of us are like Jacob. We got to learn by experience. So sometimes we find ourselves wrestling with God. So, you know, some of us are like this. And a good example today will be the Titanic. The first problem that they had was when the Titanic was built, the captain of the ship who drove this thing around the world, on all the, you know, the Pacific, the Atlantic. He said this thing was unsinkable. Not even God could sink the Titanic. The first problem that we see, and we see it in people's lives even today, is pride. Pride. They were prideful, full of pride. And the world teaches us the same junk today. You need to have self-confidence. You need to believe in yourself. You can do anything. Really? Have you tried, how many of you have ever tried to go to Pluto? Have you ever gone on a building with no parachute, 
no landing gear, no trampoline, and jump off a 10-story building. Will you live? No, you cannot do anything. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, you can do nothing without me. We're told over in, in, in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, Cursed is the man or woman who puts their faith and trust in their own abilities, in their own strength, and put it in man. There is a curse upon you if you think that in your own strength, you know what I mean, that you can really do anything apart from God. Anything that will bring him glory, anything that will, 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 will you know, accomplish anything for his kingdom. And this world teaches us pride. It teaches us black pride. It teaches us gay pride. It teaches us to flex. You know what I'm talking about? And now they got this word, it teaches us to swag. You know what I mean? How many heard the word swag before? Oh, they got swag. What's that mean? Come on, Josh. What's what swag mean? I mean, you know what they be talking about. You out, you, you be around some of them sometimes. Swag. You know what God tells in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6? That God resisteth the proudful, the pride. And you know why he says, you can turn to 1 Peter, Peter 5, 6. You know why he says this? Peter said it because Peter was prideful. Peter was known as big man. Nobody could whoop me. Is what he thought until he gets humiliated in front of a little by a little girl in a fire by denying Jesus several times. And, and so Peter said, Man, God pushes away. The word resistant means to push away the prideful. That's why he says that, you know, God tells us to humble ourselves before God. I heard people say, Well, man, God's gonna have to humble me. Well, God's humbling. Yes, he is. I, I will say this. If you better fall on the rock or the rock will fall on you and crush you. But God requires that we do it to what we humble ourselves. Under the mighty hand of God, it goes on to say in 1 Peter 5, and he shall exalt us in due season. Proverbs 16, verse 8. You can turn there. Proverbs 16, verse 8. I'm sorry, it's Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a holy spirit before fall. Let me just say this. If you see somebody's prideful, you see they walk around here, they lean, you, you, they leaning back this in their car. They think they something. They walk around. She thinks she's something because she got some high heels on with some bling on. You think you something because you got all this fake hair on or whatever or real hair. You think you all this and that. Let me say this. Stay away from me. Because great will be the fall when you fall. Because God will deal with you. Proverbs chapter 6. In Proverbs chapter 6, Joshua says there are six things that God hates. The seventh is an abomination. I think it's Proverbs 6 verse 16. The first thing on the list, God says, is, is haughty eyes, or a, as the New King James puts it, the New Translation put it, a prideful look. A prideful look. You know, a, a young man I know just joined one of these um, sororities, what do they call them? What do the men join? Fraternity, sorority. Which one? Which one is that? Somebody help me out. Fraternity. <laughs> you know, it ain't nothing but a bunch of masons. You know what I'm saying? It just got a new name with it. I ain't saying they're all like that. Some of them try to give God the glory. I got. I don't know, but 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 which God? Who knows? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, anytime you got a group with secret handshakes, you got a group that you know that that. Um, Anyway, it, 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 let me just move off of that. But whatever, he joined one of these groups as a young man. He's in college. And he told me he had this look on his face and one of his Facebook things, and the look was like a real, like a mean look. And I said, what was that about? He said, they told us to look like that, to look tough, you know, to show what we have been through. I said, man, when you get a chance, go read Proverbs chapter 6. He said, what was that first one? I said, Proverbs chapter 6. <laughs> okay? Because God hates that look. Galatians 6. You all can turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, 2, and 3. Paul says, If one be overtaken in a fault, you are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you fall. You ain't all that. You know what I'm saying? They were prideful. And this is part of the reasons why it happened. I remember we had a, I used to coach an AAU team. That, that AAU team was interesting. You know what's interesting about it is that 
we were young. When we first started AU team, we were, we were young. They were young. The kids were, were young. I mean, I think Joshua was maybe 12, somewhere around there, 11, 12. And, you know, we had a pretty decent 11, 12-year-old, but they were just young, Miss Francis, and, and they weren't that good. So we played this one team, and this team had guys on it that were older. And I remember we were, they were like, man, these guys, they grown men. Because they used to joke and say, man, they drove away in a car. One or two of them had a beard. They would say all this stuff, you know. We got, we played this one team. They wiped us out. I mean, they beat, they got a hundred on us. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to get a hundred in an AU game. They got a hundred. The school board flipped, you know what I'm saying? Some of the kids were crying, it seemed like, you know. They were, I mean, it was bad. The team was bragging, and dunk. Someone was dunking at 11 and 12. And I remember after the game, kids were dejected and everything else. And, and so we went, as we were walking away, we went and we made our way to the other court to watch them play somebody else. Oh, yeah. And we watched them, Miss Francis, and oh yeah, you remember that time? They got what they deserved, boy. They was getting their butt kicked. I mean, it was some team was stopping them, and we was on the sidelines. Yeah, yeah. Proverbs twenty-four verse seventeen says, "Listen, do not gloat when God is dealing with your enemy, because God will turn around and he'll, he'll he'll take off that punishment. So you better watch that." But we were like, "Yeah," but they were prideful. I shared before about Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali said, listen, I'm the man. I mean, his mouth would run 100 miles an hour, they say. And Muhammad Ali was on an airplane one time. And he said, man, you know, listen, this, this airplane ain't nothing. Listen, I'm Muhammad Ali. I'm Superman. I'm Superman. He kept telling the stewardess, I'm Superman. I'm Muhammad Ali. She said, sit down and put your seatbelt on. He said, no, I'm Superman. And then she just looked him right in his face and said, listen, if you Superman, Superman don't need no airplane, do it. He just laughed, sat down and put his seatbelt back on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Luke 17.10. Luke 17.10 says that after, y'all can turn here, that after you have done the will of God, after you've been obedient, you've done what God told you to do, you know what you're to do? You're to step back and you're to say, Luke 17.10, I am Still an unprofitable servant. Wow. You step back and look at yourself and say, I'm still nothing. On the Titanic, there were all types. There were rich people. There were poor people. There were 11 millionaires on the Titanic who died. 11 millionaires died on the Titanic. Wow, you ever think about that? There were all types. There were women. There were children. There were black people, white people. There were two black men who died on the Titanic. In fact, guess what? In Harlem, they say that when the Titanic went down, the, the black, uh, black community was rejoicing because they said, you know what? Hey, <laughs> you know, that's what they did for the way they treat us. Well, guess what? They didn't realize. The next day later, they found out that there were two blacks who died on the Titanic. Then, then all of a sudden the rejoicing stopped. But you know what it reminds me of Revelation 20 verse 12. It says that when John saw, he saw, he saw a great white throne. And he saw a multitude of people. He said he saw the great and the small, as the King James puts it. He saw, in so many words, he saw the rich and famous. He saw homeless people. He saw those who were on TV day and night. He saw those who were on the street, who had regular jobs. He saw all these people who had rejected God standing before the great white throne judgment. You see, Proverbs chapter uh, 11, verse 4 says that, that, that riches cannot, Proverbs 11, 4, riches cannot save you in a day of adversity. They will not save you when you stand before God. It reminds me of one of the people who were on a Titanic whose name was Arthur Pashon. Arthur Pashon was a millionaire. He had taken on the Titanic, they say, $300,000 in cash to do business in your, at overseas somewhere, I guess, coming back here. He had $300,000 cash in suitcases within his room. When a Titanic was going down, he went to get in the lifeboat. And as he was getting ready to get in the lifeboat, he said, excuse me, sir, can you give me a second? got to run back to my room and get something. The, the, the guy said, hey, man, you better hurry up. I respect who you are. 
and they all figured he's going back to get his money, the suitcases of money. He comes back and he runs back to the light bulb, gets to the light bulb, and they say, what's that in your hand? And he's got three oranges. Three oranges that you eat. And they said, why'd you get that? He said, because guess what? My money won't save me if I'm stuck out at sea for two or three days. I need whatever I can eat for the next two and three days. Reminds me of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 12 through 14. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. It's vexation of spirit and chasing the wind. That's what it is. It's just stuff. You cannot, 1 Timothy 6, 7, and the authorized version says something very important. It says, you brought nothing into this world. What else does it say? Somebody help me out. If you got uh, um, a King James, King James, it says, surely, or certainly. Certainly, that, that, that word just, just, just jumps out. Certainly, you shall take nothing out. They say that, listen, I'm telling you, if you, if you think you're going to take stuff out, believe me, there are grave robbers out here. Listen, they, robbed, they, they got uh, King Tutankhamen. They took all his stuff up in that place, Cleopatra stuff. Listen, they're going to take your stuff. They, my mother, who worked in a morgue, said that there was people in there stealing rings and, and stuff that people had on them. In fact, you know what I found out, Josh? I didn't notice. They say most people were buried or buried with no underwear. Because that's what they realize. You can't even take that with you. They ignored the warning signs. Seven times. Six to seven times, they say. They sent messages to the Titanic telling them it was going to fall. It was going to sink. Be careful. Watch out where you're going. Be careful. You're going into a, a place where there's, there's, there's icebergs. Be careful. But they ignored it. Uh, and, and what they did, first of all, is they ignored what they saw. I remember when I was 12 years of age. My granddad died. I didn't know him. I went to the funeral. I looked at that man in the casket, and I went off. I said, ah I was crying. I was falling on the floor, Josh. They had to take me, Miss Francis. I was 12 years old. I didn't even know my granddad. I'm crying. They grabbed me, several of the men, and take me out of the room. I'm like, oh, no. You know why I was crying? First Kings 2.2 2 says, because I realized at that time, guess what? I've got to go all the way of the earth. <laughs> you know, I was really thinking about myself. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't thinking about him. See, you know, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 2 says you can learn. Ecclesiastes 7 2, Josh says, you can learn more in the house of mourning than you can in the house of feasting. In so many words, you learn more at a, at a funeral than you do at a wedding because it goes on to say because there a person will consider their end. Death is 10 out of 10. None of us make it out alive. There are only, only us who are Christians because we pass from death to life. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll never die. But we don't make it out alive. You know, it reminds me. Downtown there's a FedEx. That's a FedEx Joshua. I take packages for my job, and there's a guy who works there. And his name is James. And I go in there one day, at least his name is James. And Drop a package off. So the next day I come in there, and there's a guy in there whose name is Solomon. He's an older fellow. I said, hello from the Middle East. I said, hello, Solomon. Man, what a great name, Solomon. He says, yes. I said, you know where your name comes from? He says, yes, in the Bible somewhere. I said, yeah, that's right. I said, man, he was a great man, man. You have to trust God. You need to read your Bible. He's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. A few days later, I go there. Me and Josh, we drive there. I go inside, and there. It's a guy, young dude, Lisa. He's probably about 22, 23. I said, what's that, man? What's that? I said, man, look at your name tag. What's your name? He said, it's Seth. Seth. I said, do you know where I came from? He said, yeah, they say it's in the Bible. I said, really? I said, then I start looking at him. I said, what's that on your arm? He said, the saw 27, man. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He said, I don't know why. I had it done when I was young. I don't know. I said, man, look. There's somebody who works here whose name is James, isn't it? He said, yeah. I said, somebody named Solomon worked at it. He said, yeah. I said, your name's Seth. He said, yeah. I said, Saul 27 on your arm. He said, yeah. He started laughing. I said, and my son out in the car, his name is Joshua. And you, isn't that enough message for you today to open your Bible and read it? You know what it reminds me of? 
reminds me of a young man that just hired on my job. And his name is Micah. I said, how you doing? He says, I'm doing fine. My name is Micah. I said, Micah? I said, man, that's interesting. I said, you know where it came from? He said, they said it's in the Bible. I said, that's right. I said, read Micah 5 too. He said, Micah 5 too. I said, that's right. <laughs> you see, it all reminds me of, of what was the guy's name? Anderson. Um, the, and the stories that he would tell. One of the ones he told was about a, a king. The king was sick and tired of everyone just, you know, taking him, you know, just being like, I don't know, kind of butt kisser. So the king decided that he would get a new wardrobe. Josh, and this new wardrobe that he, that he had would, would be the, the wardrobe of nakedness. So guess what he did? He decided to walk around naked. And he would say to his subjects, do you like my clothing? And they'd be like, oh, that's nice. Hey, you look good, King. You look good. He had a parade. Everybody's like, King, you look good. We like those new clothes you got on. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, some little kid yells out, the king has on no clothes. The king is naked. <laughs> he could see what the others didn't. The people in the Titanic, they refused. They ignored the warnings. They ignored what they saw. They ignored what they heard. Seven times they were warned. There were notes being, they were, they were being sent information through the, you know, the, um, the cold thing, and they, would, they rejected it. What they would do is they would be like, you know what? Just forget the guy who was taking in the information said, listen, this is getting on my nerves. They're being warned. Iceberg, slow down. Iceberg. He wouldn't even relate a message to the captain. He would be like, listen, I'm trying to send messages to people's families about life, how fun it is on this ship. I don't have no time for this. And he ignored it. You know what gets me? Is that you got people who come to church. See, church is a dangerous place. If you come here to hear the word, you better come with your heart right. Because God will harden it. It's amazing how people ignore the word of God. Me and Josh went knocking on people's doors um, in this community not too long ago. It was about, about two weeks ago. As we're knocking on doors, inviting people. I can hear some of them inside running and hiding. <laughs> you all this paper. <laughs> and people, what's your church? How many times have you turned on the radio and there's someone trying to just share the gospel, trying to share the message, and, and people just don't have time for it. They don't want to hear it. And this is why, and this is why some people say, well, I don't have time to, to come to church. I got to watch King of Thrones or whatever that thing, your thongs, whatever. Listen, you got people who won't even listen. I got neighbors who are out there washing their car, listening to, to secular music instead of coming to church on Sunday. You know, it reminds me of Proverbs 29, verse 1. It says, he that is often reproved, it, 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 it hardens his heart, and they are cut off suddenly, and that without remedy. And then it's, it's just a sudden. Luke 17, 27. Jesus said, it shall be like the days of Noah. And remember in the days of Noah, if y'all remember, it says that they, Jesus says that they were marrying, and that they were eating and drinking, and then he mentions marriage again. Isn't that interesting? He says, then they were given in marriage. You know what's amazing about that is that now we have a society that's trying to twist marriage. And Jesus said that's how it would be in the last days when he refers to marriage. Isn't that something? He says, he goes on to say, in Hebrews chapter, we're told in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8. In Hebrews 3, 8, Hebrews is full of warnings, by the way. Hebrews 3, 8. Hebrews 3, 15. Hebrews 4, 7. If you hear his voice. If you hear his voice. If you hear his voice. Don't harden your heart. Because I'm telling you, some people close off their ears in Acts 7, 57. In Acts 7, 57, my brother Stephen. Remember, he was a great brother of God. We're going to see him when we get to heaven. Remember, Stephen stood up and was telling them how that they, the, the Sanhedrin, how that they had rejected God, crucified Jesus, and that their heart was hard, their heart was hardened, and that God was going to deal with them. And remember, he said, you guys who have stiff neck, your necks are stiff neck, your heart is hardened, and your ears are uncircumcised. And you know what? They got so mad at Stephen, they picked up stones to stone him. And as Stephen was talking and telling them about the things of God, they put their hands on their ears. They stopped their ears. Remember as a kid, you would be like, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear blah, 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 blah. That's what they did. And brought stones and stoned him to death. And guess what? God would deal with, dealt with them for that. But you know what's interesting about it? Paul got saved out of that whole experience. Listen, don't be dull of hearing. 
it says that even in the church in Hebrew chapter 5, that some people are dull of hearing. We can get to the point where we just hear it over and over again and it has no effect. And if that is you, you will find yourself in danger. Next week we'll see that they had a chance to escape. Even in our society today, God has given us an escape route. And it's Jesus. There's only one door. There's only one way. People think when they get to heaven, God has some kind of back door, some kind of secret thing. Uh, I, like someone told me this morning, you don't understand what I've been through. <laughs> God, what difference does that make? You better trust Jesus. It's like the other day we were listening to the, the other night we were listening to the Kennedys and, and how the young Kennedy, um, when his mother, uh, Jackie Massas, died, he said about her, he said, yes, yeah, she died. She was there with her family and with all her books. All her books were there. Book! Books! I was like, where's the book? You know what I'm saying? Where's the word of God? All her books. As if that's going to save you. Anyway, we'll look more into this next week. Father, be with us as we make our way through the rest of this day. Be with us as we make our way through the rest of this week. Today, Lord, as we've seen, you are God. You are sovereign. You do what you please. But you and your mercy have had mercy on us. We thank you, Lord. You've had mercy on us. You've given us eternal life, something we do not deserve. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that we're here breathing your air. We're on your earth, on your green earth, walking on your dirt. We thank you for your mercy in all of our lives. And not only that, God, help us not to... to to even think to question who you are and what you do. We pray, Father, that we would learn to accept that you are God, not just the way it is. And we pray today, too, Father, that we would learn lessons when it comes to being warned so that our lives will not end up, as Paul said, shipwrecked. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We have a song here at the end. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord give you peace. May the Lord give you rest. May the Lord bless you in all that you do. May he make his face to shine upon you. Provide all your needs. Take care of you. And may you draw closer to him. May you draw near to him. And know that he heard you. And he's seen your afflictions. And that he is on the way to help you. A song at the end. Can you remember, can you? Oh, but I'm still here. Who was that by? Canton Spiritual? Or the what? The Williams Brothers. But I'm still here. Many of us have gone through difficult times, difficult things in life, but we're still, if you look at it, you're still here. That means that God still has a plan for your life. God bless. <laughs>
Catholic. 